their lives and what they are and what they have and what they need to do and what they've, uh, they, they've done. They, they, these are all treasures to be offered to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is important for us to grasp with great acceptance that God, our God, is a source of all wealth, whether it be material, intellectual, or spiritual. We read that in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. Right? All wealth, be it material, be it spiritual, yours, O Lord, is the greatness of the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is a kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. I wonder if we can understand that. I wonder if we can understand that. You know, a lot of other religions have tangible statue, statues, have tangible objects of one kind or another. And people find comfort in being able to see things, to tangibly hold on to things. We're like that. We're like that. In Christianity, it's, it's a free offering of worship to Jesus Christ. We don't see Jesus standing in front of us. We know he's there. But we don't, we don't see something tangible. And so it's easy for me to neglect to offer to Jesus what I ought to offer to him. We need to get to that place where we can envision Jesus visualizing as standing right next to us, living inside of us, maintaining that commitment to service, that commitment to prayer, that commitment to worship, that commitment to giving him what is rightfully his. The people I gave willingly in seeking to serve the Lord and to give to the Lord, we have to be acutely aware of who He is and what He desires. Chapter 35 and verse 31. Chapter 35 and verse 31 of, uh, of Exodus. It says, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. We have to recognize what God has given us, and we see this in the connection of obedience and holiness, so as to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Because we are not going to be led by the Holy Spirit of God if we're not holy. We're not going to be led by the Spirit of God if we're not obedient. If we're not following after the Lord Jesus Christ in holiness, that is moral purity, by not doing things that are wrong before God, not thinking and believing things that are morally wrong and incorrect, and through our behavior in our workplace, in our homes, as we treat our, our wives, our husbands, our children, our relatives, if we do not play those things correctly, the Spirit of God can't lead us. In the absence of surrender to the Spirit of God, there you will find an absence of God directing you. God who gives us skills, abilities, and opportunities is willing to use them as we, through our walk with Him, make them available to Him. Through salvation, we have entered into a covenant relationship with Christ. His word is immutable, it's unchangeable. If there is any change, it's because of our neglect in maintaining that relationship. In Exodus, God came down in chapter 34 and he made a covenant with the children of Israel. After they had sinned and the golden calf had ravaged the, 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 the congregation, 
God made, at the direction and the mediation of Moses, God made a contract with them, a covenant. Coming to Christ and receiving salvation from Christ is a covenant relationship. We have made a covenant relationship. But let me, let me put a little clarification on that. It is God who makes the covenant, not us. It is God who makes the covenant. It is God who keeps the covenant. We only maintain our relationship, our allegiance to that covenant. We rely on nature. We're deceptive by nature. Jeremiah says, the heart of man is deceitful of above, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. We cannot maintain that covenant. It is God, through Christ, who maintains that covenant. So when things go wrong, guess what? Don't blame God. Look at the person looking back at you in the mirror. And that's how covenants work. There are eight distinctives that I want to share with you quickly about giving as it is reflected in the scripture. Number one, we've heard that one. People gave willingly. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? I would bet my bottom dollar that there were, there were people of means. But we live in a world where the profit motive is so strong. We live in a world where the desire to accumulate things is so strong. And don't tell me I'm wrong because I know myself. Right? We see something, we want it. We have the money, we buy it. Sometimes we don't have the money, we still buy it. <laughs> Credit cards. Profit motive is strong. But here the people gave. Now where did they get all this jewelry and all this the onyx, the gold and so on? They went to the Israelite, the Egyptians rather. Right? Before they left, right? They went and the Egyptians were unloading on them, says, go away from us. You guys are bad news for us. Go away from us. Have you ever felt insulted as a Christian when someone says, go away from me, I don't want to hear what you're saying? Don't be offended. Don't be offended. You touch the nerve. You touch the nerve. Now, of course, if we're being offensive, then that's a different story. We ought not to be. We should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We live in a society where we, we assert ourselves, right? No one's going to put one over on me, right? I'm going to tell that person. We ought not to be like that. We are lambs. We are lambs. And lambs don't do that sort of thing. Do we stand on principle? You betcha. Thomas Jefferson said, in matters of taste, swim with the tide. In matters of principle, stand firm. That should be a watchword for you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. Don't get into any arguments and discussions over what's true and what's not true in the Bible. Just tell them Jesus loves them. Tell them straight up and don't back away from it. People gave will uh, willingly. God had delivered them from Egypt. He had defeated the Egyptians. They crossed the Red Sea. He had fed them with manna. They were going in a prescribed direction toward the promised land. They were happy. They were joyful. How has God blessed you? Do you believe in your heart that God has blessed you? How happy and how willing are you to give back to God what He has given to you? These people gave them back. <coughs> God used what they had to build a tabernacle. God is not going to require of you or me or any believer in Jesus Christ what we don't have. You know what he said to, to uh, Moses? What's that in your hand? That staff. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your power? Your control. 
that you're willing to say, okay, God, you got it. What do you have in your hand? God's work on earth is always facilitated with the gifts of his people. Remember that. God's going to use you and use me to make his kingdom work. That's an incredible God. No, God could come down and dictate what to do, but he didn't do that. He's relying on me to be honest enough and loving enough to say, God, I love you, and I'll do what you tell me to do. That's the kind of God we serve. You know, God does not need our accumulated wealth, yet he chooses to use it. Actually, the possessions we have came from him, and he simply wants to know how willing we are to give it back in service to him. And I'll read just one verse, Psalm 31, verse 19. Psalm 31, verse 19. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. God is a giver. He bestows upon you and me good stuff. Good things. I don't know how many of you have read the book, the magazine, The Voice of Martyrs. I sometimes wonder though if money and things are really a blessing. That's something I, I, I go over in my head. Because it's so easy to turn my head from God when I have too much stuff. Stuff. Stuff gets in the way of God. God working. I wonder. I wonder when we get to heaven, we stand before the Lord Jesus. Some person in a jungle somewhere who knew how to thank God for what they had. What little they had. We're marching in a line and that person comes and Jesus says, hold on a minute. That brother so and so or that sister so and so come forward. And you say, Who is this person? <coughs> ah, someone who loved me. Like that woman in the Bible who gave everything she had. Didn't give a lot. Didn't have a lot. She gave what she could give. God doesn't want you to give what you can't give. God's work on earth is always facilitated through the gifts of his people. God does not need our accumulated wealth. God blesses us. The question is not what can I give, but what am I willing to give back for the work of the Lord? It doesn't matter how much money you have. God, it, it, it really doesn't matter. How much am I willing to give back? God. How, how, how much am I willing to say, thank you, Lord? I, you know, I don't care what I have. God has no wooden nickels. Okay. God is going to use what you have, what I have. Bless his work. It's a dime that I have, and I give it free. There is a myth that only wealthy people can give. Percentage wise, in the United States of America, middle class and poor people give more than rich people. Check percentage wise, not an amount, but percentage wise. It's people like you and me. I know some of you are very wealthy, and some of you, uh, you know, are much wealthier than me. Oh, I don't want to insult you, I don't want to insult anyone who is, is, is not wealthy. It's not the point of this message. But it's people like you and me that make the work of the Lord go on successful. God is interested in our motive for giving and hopes that the motive is love for him. Psalm 107, verses 21 and 22. God is asking you, what's in your heart? Psalm 107, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. God still loves you, regardless. 
and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. We do not always choose what God gives us. We do not always choose what God gives us. So don't be disheartened. But we have the awesome opportunity of choosing how to use what he has given us. That is the opportunity we have. We can choose how to use it. Don't try to give what you don't have, number four. If you're a student and you, are, you have student loans, uh, pay your loans. Pay your bills. God has personal knowledge of your station in life. He only expects you to be generous with what you can afford. Pay your bills. One way we can do something uh, uh, to give to God is shunning unnecessary extravagances. Yes. I want a shoe that's... I, I went to a shoe place down here somewhere and the cheapest shoe is $172. $172. I said, wow, that's a great shoe. Comfortable shoe, great shoe. $172. Well, I didn't buy it. Uh, and when, when, when we res re refrain from, from being extravagant, our level of generosity can rise. That's one way of giving to God. Just don't give what doesn't belong to you, hopefully. Number five, remember me and my love for when you give, God says. Remember me and my love for you when you give. The ultimate and eternal gift of Christ our Savior is a primary motivation for giving. Why do we give? Because Jesus gave. That's why we give. No other reason. He gave. That was the ultimate gift. No other gift has ever and will ever surpass that gift. Think for a moment tonight when you need to pray. What Jesus went through. His visage was marred more than any man. He was brutally, brutally treated. God, God Himself was beaten up for your name. Think about it. I'm not trying to be glory here. Someone died for me. So I forgive. God forgave your sin, the song says, in Jesus' name. God forgave your sin. And the chorus says, freely you have received. Freely given. Number six. Giving is not a game or a competition. Now these folks in Exodus chapter 36, they use their gifts as a wave offering before God. In, 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 in a way of celebrating that God was blessing them. And you know, there's some excitement that can be had in, in doing something positive, exciting for God. And you see the result. That's wonderful. It's great. That should not be our modus operandi. That should not be the only way we operate. Sometimes we give. And we don't see the result of that giving. But there's a song that I used to sing. It says, I am here. Because you gave. One day, you and I will walk on the streets of glory, and you'll meet someone who will come to you and say, thank you for giving. Thank you for giving. We're human, we don't want to uh, wait for our, too long for our rewards. We want to, uh, we want to uh, enjoy our goodies right now, our academics. 
maybe we need to uh, wait for when we get to heaven. Number seven, giving unifies in solidarity folks that are all in on a journey. People climb the rocks. Everyone depends on, on each other. A baseball team. Everyone works as a team. Football team. Teamwork. That is the intention of God throughout the scripture. That is the intention of God. The tabernacle was a community effort. You read in chapter 35, we're going to turn to it, chapter 35, verses 5, <coughs> chapter 36, uh, verse 22. It keeps saying, they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. The people worked together. They had a result for which it could be really, really exciting. So giving unifies. Giving dissuades boastfulness and a sour spirit. When everybody gets into the pot and mixes up, it gets going. It dissuades us from being bitter and argumentative and sour or even boastful. Number eight, giving should be with expectation celebration. When we get to that building, we should break out in great celebration. The first person who walks up to that author who gives his or her heart to Jesus Christ it should be an occasion for great celebration. Great celebration. Skip so that we can celebrate. There was, uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, invite you, invite the, the ushers, please, come forward. Um, There are some instructions. I won't go through these instructions. You can read them. Um, right. Uh, there's a sheet called One is Faith, Promise, Giving. It explains it pretty clearly. I won't go through it for the sake of time. Uh, there are two sheets to that, please. All right, because it's back in front. And then what I'd like you to do with, it, with this uh, sheet that says, My Faith Promise Pledge. And uh, you are not pledging anything uh, in, 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 in concrete. It's not an offer here. This is a faith promise. In, in, in 1928, Oswald J. Smith of the People's Church in Toronto uh, introduces this idea, this concept of faith promise given. Uh, let me just read what it is. It is a promise strictly between you and God. If you decide you cannot give as you promised, then you tell God alone. Only He and you will know. And before you fill it out, do not sign your name. Your name is not required in that form. Secondly, it is waiting before God for His instructions as, as to what he wants you to give in regard to reaching the world with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and moving this ministry along. If you, in your generosity and in your, your uh, uh, pledge to God, would like to do something toward moving this ministry along, then put that figure down, what you can afford what you feel God is, uh, will allow you to afford to give to this ministry. Put that figure down on the paper. Do not put your name on it. Do not put your name on it. All right? Faith promise giving is waiting before God for his instructions as to what he wants you to give in regard to reaching the world 
the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. I think I read that before. In an act, number three, of faith that God will supply for other things which arise as you pro proceed in giving what you promised Him. If you believe in this ministry, if you're trusting God to bless this ministry, and if this ministry is blessed and you're a participant, you will be blessed too. God's blessing is not confined to just some people, or people who give large amounts, or people who, uh, whatever. God's blessing filters down to whomever you are, whatever you do, in faith, in obedience to Him. So, if you would put your name, please, I'm sorry, put the amount, please, that you'd like to give in faith promise. And then over on the right side, check off uh, how long you want to pray each day for this ministry and for the people in this ministry. I appreciate that, and then we can return those sheets. All right, these sheets will be put away. And uh, we, we will simply... Trust God to fulfill the promises made to you. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise. We ask, Lord, that your blessing may rest upon this congregation. As we move forward in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray that you instruct us, teach us, guide us in that place of great celebration, great commitment. In Jesus Christ, we pray in His name.